When a pilot typically cancels IFR, the strip goes away. I stop looking. Yeah, I'm done with you. Not to say that we don't care, but your relationship's over at that point. She's actually watching you all the way to the ground and making sure everything's good. So I think she did a very good job. That's really the highlight of all this. She even managed to produce laughter, which I don't think I've ever done on the mid. You know, I've chuckled on frequency before during the day, but at three in the morning, (laughs) no. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 6 to 8, Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on Live ATC. Good day. November 643, Juliet Mike, third visual truck, runway 23 left, Connect Tower. November 3222, Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 Band miles. Uh, 3047, Charlie, try a departure, radar contact, climb and maintain. November 747, Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on final. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk to your far frequency change approved. Sierra 720 Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Runway 23 left. Third to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special. Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Tron Alpha, this is Triad Approach on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed. Say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, November 22nd, 2021, episode 204. On today's show, we'll discuss a real-life through-flight clearance, entering class Delta airspace when it's super busy, and more of your awesome questions and feedback. What's up, Paige? Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Yes. Happy early Thanksgiving. Thank you. Four more days until chaos ensues. Hmm. Hmm. I think the weather's supposed to be good. Like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's good. I was really hoping it was going to be bad. Why? You know, <laughs> we could just <laughs> sit around at work and do nothing. <laughs> it will be busy this week for sure. Yes, it will. So triad traffic on the week of is probably on, is probably similar to most similar size facilities. Airline traffic does not increase. It's the same flights. There will be less of them probably Wednesday. Well, definitely not on Thursday. They'll sit. The crews will sit in a hotel and wait to leave until Friday if they're lucky. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there usually is a pickup of GA activity, especially if the weather's good. We're at that pre-winter gap in time where they can go out and spend some money on gas and fly around so yeah Mm. Mm. you flew i did fly i flew to florida and back in the jet it was fun it was amazing Mm. and my landing was not terrible ah not terrible is good Mm -hmm. not terrible i wouldn't call it amazing but it wasn't terrible it was fun i'll take it yeah we pushed more buttons and in crews and Learn more about the G5000, which if you ever get a plane and you could put a G5000 in it, do it. It's amazing. (laughs) It's got so much capability. I probably spend the rest of my life and not know all the buttons Mm -hmm. and functionality. So, Yeah, the plane is a stretch. Uh, I don't think even the G5000 (laughs) would be like (laughs) buying an expensive car. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. I think a it's very a- expensive car. Mm-hmm. So, in addition to your very expensive plane, right? <laughs> right. 
I might I might be able to swing a G five thousand. I just wouldn't have a plane to put it in. Right, it'd be a static display. <laughs> in the house. All right, tell us where you're at in your engine, then I'll give you my brief rundown of where I'm at with my engine. Uh, the engine is pretty much buttoned up. I am just attaching the peripherals, all mm. of the things that attach to the outside, the things that I spent months and months cleaning and painting uh-huh. and de-rusting. Um, I am realizing, though, that my previous rust prevention program, which was coating everything in massive amounts of grease <laughs> and dirt, <laughs> oh. was actually working mm. because most of the fasteners are were clean. They weren't rusted mm-hmm. because they were filthy. Mm. The dirt layer of protection. Yes, which seems counterintuitive, but it actually was working. So now I'm a little bit worried that now that I've cleaned all these bolts, I've cleaned them free of grease. Mm-hmm that they might rust. I don't know if anybody has any tips on how to prevent my fasteners from rusting just so they don't look terrible. Please feel free to. How many of these peripherals can you add to the engine before you put it in? Because isn't it going to be harder to put it in the bay with all that stuff on? Is there stuff you could do when it's already in the car? There, There is stuff I will do once it's in, but anything that attaches to the block, especially lower on the block. um, You got to do it now. It has to be done now. It it would be a huge pain. And they're not in the way enough. I, I will attach as much as I can outside. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier to work on. You can walk 360 around the the motor. So, All right. I destroyed a lawnmower engine. Actually, it's not destroyed. It's probably salvageable at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I had a degree in small engine repair... And an extra uh-huh. <laughs> 15 hours a day for the next year. Oh, boy. Wow. Because <laughs> I'm sure it would take me forever to fix this thing now. Never mm. take the head off of a small engine unless you're prepared to throw it in a scrapyard. There. There's the lesson. Yes, I, I have learned that. So I learned it the hard way, and I should have told you. <laughs> I feel like it can be salvaged at this point, but uh-huh. I was looking for something to be broken. I thought the governor broke, and it was... When I opened it up and saw that the governor was not broken, I I did shed a tear. <laughs> mm. And then I mashed it with a hammer in frustration. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what uh, to do uh, now. You it's, didn't. So, no, really? I, I did not. I did not. Yeah. But I did peek underneath one of the cams, and then when I put it back, it's not in the exact same spot, which means the timing's messed up, and I'm totally screwed. So, mm. Top dead center. And then the timing marks line up should be good. Right. But one of them got picked up and put back down. Now, there's a little groove. It can only go back down one way. So it could be in the exact position that I got it out in. It's possible. Unlikely, but it's possible. Mm. Yeah. So I'm going to let it sit out there so that I can forget everything I did. So that I have to reteach myself when I go back, which will help me make an excuse on saying, you know what? This is over my head. I can't do it. I got to get, get a new bar. That's right. <laughs> Shall we begin? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ready. All right. Since OB203, we have several new patrons in the show. Listeners here, Lima Golf, Mike Mike, and Sierra Alpha are new. Welcome. And we have no new in the show supporters here, Kilo Sierra. Patrons get exclusive access to our weekly video stream, which they're watching now. Bonus content. Sometimes we do an early release. And you're part of a very large group of show supporters. Thank you, everybody. If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposing basis. If you haven't done so already, hit subscribe or follow on your podcast player so our episodes are waiting for you each week. And leave us a review and a five-star rating. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All we have a review. <laughs> we have no all right. We have no announcements. Re- no announcements. You want to get this one? I, I'm going to laugh if I do this one again. I've read it before. Oh, you have? I yes. feel like I've read it too, but... I think I sent it to you when I got it. Oh, okay. All right, you go ahead. All right, the review. My wife caught me cheating. I started listening to Opposing Bases in April 2020 after hearing AG and RH on the Stuck Mike Avcast. 
I was intrigued, so I thought I would listen. I was hooked after listening to one episode. Afterward, I listened to each upcoming episode beginning at 121 and also began listening from the beginning at 1 right up to 120. My wife, who is not a pilot, listens to opposing bases with me while we travel around in the car. She once asked if I was cheating on her. I said, what? She said, have you been listening to these to those two guys without me? <laughs> Gosh, I love that woman. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Those words were in the review. Yes, they were in the review. Thank you. I have been an instrument rated pilot since 2007. I'm amazed at how much I've learned about instrument flying in the last two years. They absolute, absolutely made me a better IFR pilot. I'm a proud patron of the OB podcast, Fox Trot Sierra from South Central PA. Thanks, guys, for a great show. Well, thank you, mm-hmm. FS. For the great review. Thank you, Papa Alpha. No, Foxtrot Sierra. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm, moving on. Mm. All right, we have a few timely feedbacks to get to. Timely feedback. <laughs> and then we're going to do an audio for our show topic today. We have to keep moving at a reasonable pace here. You can't make me laugh when I have coffee in my mouth because then I blow snot out of my nose and it gets on the microphone and it's gross. That made uh, Sippy laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he just looked at me with his gross face like, ugh. <laughs> All right, I'll start off unless you have any objections. No, please. Number one from Delta Romeo, the Apache pilot who provided some feedback last week about his Lakota training in the Army. He said, thanks, guys. Hopefully I helped clarify the Lima Uniform Hotel situation at Rucker. Looking Hell forward you, to... Yeah. Light utility helicopter. Mm, thank you. Looking mm-hmm. forward to more episodes. Can't stop talking about how helpful your show is, especially for the Apache community. We can fly IFR now. Take care, Delta Romeo. I don't know what that means. Surely he could fly IFR before. No. Oh, that's a new qualification they got? Yeah, when they got some upgrade, E-model, oh. maybe it was the E-model block, whatever, I have no idea. But at one of these upgrades, they they became slant golf capable, where before, I, I'm not even kidding, I think all they had was an NDB for instrument approaches, mm. like emergency only. They could do an emergency GPS, but they were not certified to fly around in the NAS IFR. Mm-hmm. It certainly limits your abilities. Yes, it, it, yes, and it limits their, um, not currency, but proficiency, really. So mm-hmm. I think, I don't know how long this has been going on, a couple years maybe, but, you know, the Apache community has has slowly been getting back into the instrument flying, you know, side of things. I've seen a few come to Triad doing uh, practice approaches. So Interesting. Thank you, Delta yeah. Romeo. Good luck with yeah. your IFR currency. Yes. <laughs> I I mean they were notoriously awful at at instruments. Well, yeah, now they don't they never got to practice either. No. Did they put them in a sim? Yeah, maybe in a sim. I don't know. Hmm. I mean in number a, 2. Go ahead, uh, number 2. Okay. From patron Whiskey Tingo Foxtrot. <laughs> From the <laughs> Yes, that's true. That's a new patron. He got those initials. Yes. Pretty sure it has no sem- or no resemblance to their name. <laughs> no. Uh, from the FAA Instrument Procedures Handbook, Glossary, mm. page golf three, emphasis mine, contact approach. Oh, yes. Yes, this, I this remember. This question did this come discussion. up. Yes. Okay. An approach where an aircraft on an IFR flight plan having an air traffic control authorization operating clear of clouds with at least one mile flight visibility and a reasonable expectation of continuing to the destination airport under these conditions may deviate deviate from the instrument approach procedure and proceed to the destination airport by visual reference to the surface. This approach is only authorized when requested by the pilot and the reported ground visibility at the destination airport is at least one statute mile. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot which I think is what we said. 
We did. And initially, we didn't find where it said that. And some people commented that they didn't find where it said uh, where it said that. But what, in the you, glossary. Yep, it's in the glossary, and it makes sense. If you're abandoning the instrument approach and you have no other reference, that would be your only method of navigation is having contact with Earth. Right? What else yes. could you use? What? Well, <laughs> well, you could you could be cheating. Well, yeah, but the, hopefully the, that's not <laughs> just, your first inclination to cheat and just aim yeah. direct at an airport without seeing the Earth. No, that would yeah, be bad. Oh, oh, hope it works out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I got I got the Earth in sight. Yeah, and this has come up before. Maybe we've never mentioned it uh, in context, but. I feel like it's very rare for pilots to say they have the airport for a visual approach if they don't, in fact, have the airport. Some of them might be a little bit, eh, it's over there in that area, and we're getting closer, and they have some other form of nav to get them maybe on a localizer or a final approach course. But I think for the most part, most pilots are pretty aware that it's important that you actually follow that rule. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, number three from patron Mike Zulu, fellow atc -er in the Northeast. Hello, gents. First off, belated congratulations on 200 episodes, as well as 1 million downloads. <laughs> Did I do that correctly? Mm. <laughs> yes, your your million was uh, was very good. <laughs> you needed the pinky. I did, but well, it's a podcast. They can't see my pinky, and I didn't think of it fast enough, but you're right. Mm. <laughs> I would love to have joined you at Taco Truck International Airport to celebrate, but I had to work, and the supervisor would not approve that for a FAM trip for some reason. A FAM trip is our current methodology for utilizing uh, flight deck familiarization we can get in the airplane. Pre-9-11, we could get in pretty much just walk to the airport and get on a plane, but there's a ton of red tape associated with that now. I've never done it as a controller because... Well, I spent a lot of years in a flight deck, but it's a pain in the butt. So anyway, had a couple of comments reference the tail end of OB203 on testing VFR pilots before you give them a Bravo or a Charlie clearance. I agree that that's probably a myth. I also, I always give the pilot the benefit of the doubt and base my approval solely on traffic conditions. Good. That being said, if I did see someone having trouble holding altitude or heading, it might affect the altitude or heading I give them, for example, right over the departure corridor versus wide and low. On VFR flight following requests, I truly appreciate you guys preaching the gospel, not only of requesting it, but also the correct order to do it in. I prefer the hello method with a call sign as well, but would add the location with the initial hello call. This has a couple of benefits, including not just giving me the call sign to start, but also knowing where to look and having the first fix ready to rock if you call up charlie golf x-ray foxtrot oscar over xyz for flight following and i couldn't remember that alphabet soup call sign i can just smash the magic adsb button and see your super awesome call sign without having to ask again as well as knowing the first fix to enter i love this point this is actually this very is a point. great point yes yes uh, or better yet, pawn it off on the next controller over there when the fix is just <laughs> outside my airspace without ever having to type a single letter. Again, congrats and thanks for the great show. Looking forward to another 200 MZ. Okay. <laughs> That's a very good point. Mm. Now, if I heard that happen and I've done that and I've been the recipient of that favor from the other controller, it's annoying. The only time I will say that that's okay. And I feel like I can be consistent in this is when someone is calling south when they don't own final and the airplane is in the final box. I don't want any part of tagging that airplane up mm. if final's busy. Right. That's just me. I think I'm alone on that. Island of you do it. <laughs> I, I think I just tag them up and then hand them off. Okay. That, if that it, also if works. If it's clearly obvious that they're going to be in the way, I may go so far if they're if they're VFR. If it's not somebody with a you know airborne IFR request, but if they're VFR, I might even give them a little nudge away from. Yeah, turn left or right, get final. off the final. Yeah, yeah. I just try to be careful with that. Dumping a a non your tag in someone's airspace. 
especially when they're busy doing stuff. If that airplane calls that sector, they'll realize, okay, it's super busy here right now. I have to, I have to be patient, which is what, what the point of me pawning them off would be. Wait your turn. Let them scramble through this. There's no place for you right now in this, but I, I could see it either way. Huh. So <laughs> thank you. For you know the- what? I, I, I like your method better. I, I've rethought. I have rethunk, rethinked, rethought. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's rethought. <laughs> because your method makes it harder for the other controller, which is what most controllers are striving to do. No. <laughs> if it's if they're busy, I don't have any problem if I'm busy on final, ignoring a yeah. VFR call up. Especially if it's one that's twenty miles that's away. True. But you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you wait a minute because because you're busy. Yeah, and the other guy, if he just introduces that conflict into my airspace, there's an assumption that, okay, now that airplane can get into Charlie, I don't want that relationship to start that way. I'm not going to imply that it's okay for you to keep trucking. So if you go talk to the busy person when he has time, or she, mm-hmm. I feel like that's a better method. But that's a very specific reason on why I would pawn them off. Okay. I... I, I, can, I can see that. I can see that. I do think, though, that if the other guy types him up and tags him up, that's the hard part. It is. You could do that. and not. Yeah, you could do that. It, you're right. I don't know. Putting him in the I, flash right away is probably rude. <laughs> yeah. Technically, and, and not legally, but per the... You know, per the order, you should be you should not be working a plane that isn't in your airspace. Right. So I, you know, my argument doesn't really hold any water in terms of regulation. Um. So you're probably right. You want number four? Thank you, MZ. Number four from Sierra Papa Delta. After listening to episode 200, I was recalling the order of the info for flight following from to type altitude. And I realized that the last three are TTA, also known as the Taco Truck Airport. So I will now never forget the order. Oh, I see. To type and altitude from Taco Truck Airport. Just remember that. Yeah. I like it. Don't forget your call sign. (laughs) Correct. Approach, we're at uh, XYZ and we're we're going to taco truck. (laughs) I promise there are a very small number of controllers that have a clue what you're talking about. If you say taco truck airport. (laughs) Yeah, a couple. They might might trigger some weird reactions. Don't say that on frequency. (laughs) Excuse me. Uh, thank you for that nice mnemonic aid. Number five from Patron Zulu Whiskey Gentleman. As a former P3 pilot and current P8 pilot, and my wife, a former P3 pilot, I want to apologize for the hundreds of round-robin flight plans that we have entered into the system. We were always taught to use the round-robin for- format, so it was less likely to get lost in the fax machine that had to send it somewhere else on base to get hand-jammed into the system. Is that happening still? Oh, man, don't even get me started. So (laughs) I just did. (laughs) There are some places if you are stationed and they have a base ops that they want you to file the flight plan. Like actually hand a piece of paper to base ops people and they put it in the system. It is sometimes maddening because you're then forced to use someone's going to be a, f- me up for a this. fax machine like, huh <laughs> a fax machine not a fax machine i mean if you're on the other side of the airfield you probably have to email it uh over to base ops unless you want to f- actually drive over there and hand it mm-hmm. to someone um but the military format for flight plans is archaic and burdensome and completely inefficient. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> it is a huge pain. And sometimes these base ops people 
will red pen your flight plan and send it back to you and say, you made a mistake here. Your format is wrong here. You know, what's, I, I calculated all of your times and your fuel and you're off by f- five pounds at the end. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what? I'll just file it online. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me read the rest of this. That, I don't think that was the point of their feedback, but no, it wasn't, but I take, he continues. I take little comfort in most of my flights were in the Pacific Northwest and coffee town center had to fix my flight plans. <laughs> it explains the numerous clear to direct destination clearances that I received. This combined with the fact that we were hanging out in the actual no man's land between flight level one enter zero and two six zero, which we talked about last week, mm-hmm. also known as the bumpiest place in the airspace. <laughs> I am moving on to greener pastures of Acme and Lone Star Acme once I figure out which job to accept. That's a nice predicament to be in. But mm-hmm. either way, I don't think there are any round robin flight plans in my future. There are not. Thanks for including Billy's review in the 200th episode. He sounds like a good kid. Patron Zula Whiskey. All right. The <laughs> emphasis in here was meant to be on the round robin versus itinerant one flight plan and then one coming home, which in a jet or an airplane that's capable and filing for above, we'll just call it 11,000 feet for argument's sake. It would be much easier for controllers if you had a second flight plan filed, especially when it triggers a departure SID. Uh, That is a nightmare for controllers. But I think it's funny that you take comfort in the fact that Coffee Center had to do it. Uh, They probably love that. Uh, So, But if you're forced to use a fax machine and base ops, I don't blame you for doing one, one and done. Be done with it and let it be somebody else's problem. But mm-hmm. that sounds like a royal pain. All right. That's all we have for time with feedback. Thank you, Zula Whiskey. Anything to add to that one? No. Okay. <laughs> all right. Today's show topic is... Brought to us because of Romeo Hotel's feedback. Alpha Golf AG thought I should pass this flight following story of my through clearance from the other night. I read that all incorrectly. I should pass along the following story about my through clearance from the other night. I guess since a through clearance is about as common as a contact approach and the fabled jackalope, maybe we can all learn something. I was headed to Blacksburg to transport a patient to Charlottesville, but the patient required a special piece of equipment that is kept at the hospital in Roanoke. Ceilings across the area were 1,000 feet, plus or minus 200 feet, so going VFR was not an option. The plan was to stop, I'm sorry, to hop over to the hospital for five minutes to grab the equipment, then depart there and head to Blacksburg. We have proprietary approaches and departures at Roanoke Hospital, as well as our base. We also have one of those in our airspace. Have Mm -hmm. you used that one, that Copter 7? Yes. Okay. While en route to the hospital, it hit me that this would be a perfect opportunity for a through clearance since no one else is flying and we will only need about five minutes on the roof. The whole conversation happened over the radio, so thanks to modern technology, it will be recorded for all time. (laughs) (laughs) The controller was very accommodating and definitely cheery for that time of morning. However, this is not my first radio conversation with her. Sometimes early in the morning on a long flight home, I will use the dead air to ask my local controllers burning questions like, Can I use an approach to a closed runway if I'm not actually landing there, but just using it to reach VMC and go to a nearby (laughs) hospital? And also, if the MVA is lower than the MDA for the initial segment for an approach, do I really need to climb back up to the MDA, or can I just stay lower? All right. Let's build this up a little bit. What's that? That last one is a great question. That is a good question. Uh, We could go on and on about that. All right. So I condensed. Thank you for sending the audio in. You sent me... I think there's a time frame where you can get audio from liveetc.net before it, it's no longer archived. I think it's 30 days. And you did send this to me. I took the two 30-minute increments and whittled it down to just under six minutes. Uh, let's set this up. You've listened to this, right? Yes. All right. Why don't you set us up on big picture what's happening so we kind of have a clue what's going on. Oh, gosh. Uh, well... It's the it's the mid shift. So the controller is by herself. Most I likely, think, yes. Most likely. In the tower. 
and it is like two in the morning or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. It's oh dark thirty. Right. Which is the bread and butter for medevac flights. They do a lot of their work at night. Yes. Um This is the setup I'm looking for from you. Like a solo pilot helicopter at night. Oh. Kind of the context of where he's at. Okay. Yeah, mountainous terrain at night. Uh, he is probably aided uh, visually, so he has goggles, uh, which is a tremendous advantage. Uh, but you're still IMC. Once you're IMC, goggles do nothing. I mean, right. it's pointless. You just flip <laughs> them up and try to get them from blocking your view, keep them from blocking your view of the instruments. Uh, <laughs> it is um, that is a demanding mode of flight in a helicopter by yourself at night IMC in mountainous terrain. No, right. Not the most fun. So I think, I think that's a good uh, hats off to those guys. Medevac guys. I think you're crazy, <laughs> uh, but you're doing it. You're doing very important work. So thank, thank exactly. You. All right. We'll go ahead and play the audio. We'll talk about it afterwards. Here we go. Let me let me start one more thing. I did not take out all the identifiers in this. It would have been super confusing. He wants to go from point A to, to point B by stopping at point, well, A to C and stopping at B. And if I took those names out, it would have messed this whole thing up. So, okay. all right. And since I know this person, I would just like to make fun of them <laughs> now for saying and approach. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to hear that again because this auto rewinds. Here we go. And approach, matter of fact. Uh, excuse me, I just a question for you. Do you guys ever do through flights? Have you ever done through flight clearances? I personally have never done one, but I can look it up and give you one if that's what you need. <laughs> well, I'm going to be uh, heading to Blacksburg. Uh, I, I'm going to need about five minutes on the rooftop, and then I'm actually going to be going ISR to Blacksburg. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, if I can get a through flight, basically to Blacksburg, Via Victor Golf six two, if you could do that, or if uh, or if this is easier just to keep my squawk and then file a different a uh, different flight plan. What I'll do is I'll amend this flight plan to Blacksburg. I'll keep you cleared to the hospital once you are on the rooftop at the hospital and landing assured. You can let me know, and I'll clear you to Blacksburg via the departure. We'll do it that way. Perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, 6 miles from 5 and cross 5 and at or above 5,200, cleared on and approach into RMH. And maintain 5,200 to 5 and cleared for the RNAV 072. Five Whiskey Lima. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, approach. I'll try something new tonight, straight out of the book. You're cleared to Victor Golf 62. Correction, you're cleared to back Blacksburg Airport through. Victor Golf 62 via the Zapfu 1 departure. On departure, car maintains 6,000. Third, via uh, Victor Golf 62 and the Zapfu 1 departure. So we go in and read back to correct. On departure, car maintains 6,000. Report airborne. So report airborne on departure. Yeah, I've never done one of these, but. Uh, if I understand, like, the uh, the FedEx guys and them will use it because, uh, you know, they make a lot of little stops along the way. Yeah, it definitely makes sense, and I just read it straight out of the book. So here we go. As long as you and I both know what you're doing, I'm okay with it. And then next five with you, you can change to advisory. Other radio on the, uh, the hospital, so uh, we'll just stay with, I'll just stay with you if you need to call us. Sounds good. Thank you. And approach. I was feeling to see. No, we did break out. We'll be landing momentarily. Roger, you think the bases are about 2,000? Uh, I would put them right at 2-2 two, two MSL. Approach. Medic 5 was feeling. Medic 5 was feeling approach. Hey, after a zap blue on the departure, I'm going to be requesting zap snow. For the straight in RNAV runway 31. Roger, you can expect that. While you're sitting there on the rooftop, you want the weather for Blacksburg too? 
Yeah, I'll take what you got. My uh, my little knee board might not necessarily be accurate. I'm pulling up the 0415. Let me see if there's a more current one. Medivac 5 with you, Lima. The weather for Blacksburg is 0435, auto observation, wind calm, visibility 10, ceiling 2300, overcast, temperature 162.16, and they're showing all the altimeters 3016. All right, 3016 on the altimeter. Should break out, no problem. We're actually going to Montgomery Regional Hospital, which is real close. Um, and then on departure from there, probably it's going to take me at least 30 minutes on the ground, if not more. Uh, we'll be heading up to Charlottesville. Roger, if it's going to be 30 minutes, I'll get you to file an IFR to Charlottesville from there. Absolutely. Midrack 5, Lucy Lima, your still radar contact and inside out the window. Midrack 5, Lucy Lima, your still radar contact and inside out the window. Climb maintain 6,000. 6,000, 5, Lucy Lima. Actually, 5, Lucy Lima, you can climb and maintain 5,200. All right, climb over 5,200, 5 Whiskey Lima. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, turn left direct Zazno, 1 0 miles from Zazno, cross Zazno at 5,200, clear to RNF 3 1, approach into Blacksburg. All right, left direct Zazno, 5,200, Zazno clear the approach, 5 Whiskey Lima. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, I'm trying my best to make it easy for you. On your receipt, there will be a re review box. You can review your services. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will, uh, I will, uh, I'll give you the five star, uh, rating. I'll take it. I learned something new tonight, so thanks for being a good team player. I'm to do it. It didn't seem like you were too busy. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, report your IFR cancellation in the air. This frequency are on the ground. 124.85. Change your badge frequencies approved. Five Whiskey Lima, we'll go. Approach Medivac 135, Whiskey Lima, canceling IFR. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, IFR cancellation received. You can port landing assured for me. Uh, we'll go. Medivac 135, Whiskey Lima, landing assured at Montgomery Regional. Medivac 5 Whiskey Lima, change your browser frequency approved. We'll talk to you in a little bit. All right, that's it. That's pretty much the whole whole shot from point A to B to C. What do you think? What what a service. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that's about an hour's worth of audio shrunk down. Uh, so obviously that didn't happen that, that quickly. But I think at the end, I want to say this before I forget. When a pilot typically cancels IFR, the strip goes away. I stop looking. Yeah, I'm she, done with you. But she finished that with, hey, tell me when your landing is assured, you know, yeah. which means she's not to say that we don't care, but your relationship's over at that point. She's actually watching you all the way to the ground and making sure everything's good. So it was just one extra step in a million steps that she took in the middle of the night to learn how to do a through clearance, say it correctly, stumbled a little bit, but hey, she was reading it out of the book, trying to insert the right airports, <clears throat> uh, gave him weather, made it where he didn't have to change frequencies a ton. He made a comment about, there's no radio on top of the hospital, so I'll just stay with you. And I don't know if you picked it up. She could see him out the window. Yeah, yeah. When he left, probably when he landed too. I just thought the whole interaction was a sign of, you know, good service for her. He was playing along. He understood. She got improvised at first. I'll just put you in through Blacksburg. I'll keep her flight plan open. She's probably flipping through the pages of the book. And so, wait a second. <laughs> I could do this this way. Yeah. And and found the right way to do it. I don't know. I think the whole thing was a good demonstration of what can be done. The opposite of that could have been, I don't know how to do a through clearance. You're cleared to this hospital airport. File another IFR flight plan. And then we'll talk about it when you get out, when you want to leave there. But it would have been difficult that's a lot of extra work and he only wanted to be on that rooftop for five minutes so i think she did a very good job that's really the highlight of all this she even managed to produce laughter <laughs> <laughs> which i don't think i've ever done on the mid that is probably you know i've true. chuckled on frequency before during the day but at three in the morning <laughs> no <laughs> Why are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> That's because you spent years on a mid with no traffic. Not 
the other six mids in the week have airplanes, including Ugh, the one that you would do point. now if you did mids. <laughs> Ugh, it's just awful. It's really... <laughs> There's something to do all night on our mid. It's terrible. It really is. Mids are so much better without planes. <laughs> That's another thing to highlight here. This was uh, probably a good thing for anybody in the tower when it is dead. And I don't think there was a lot of other frequency traffic that night. It may have been one of two at the most customers at one time. And it, it keeps you engaged. It keeps you interested. And not just, you know, daydreaming while you're waiting for your shift to be over when it's that slow. That's that's probably the hardest thing on the mid if it is slow is staying, staying focused and alert because you still have to be able to do your job. So, right. Um, yeah, hats off to her. Hats off to the pilot for being patient and letting her work her way through that. Um, if you didn't pick up on it, the through flight clearance is I far the whole way. She would have been protecting that airspace from the point the aircraft landed on the, the rooftop until he left again. Luckily, she could see him, but in a case where you wouldn't be able to, she had that blocked off. I believe she gave him an EFC, didn't she? Uh, maybe that was implied with the five minutes he said, right? I'm not sure she did. Um, but the whole point of it was it minimized the amount of work he had to do a single pilot IFR pilot at night in the terrain. And it helped her learn something along the way. So hats off to you. Yeah. And that airport, by the way, has, it's not the real airport that you heard. It's a totally different fictitious airport. (laughs) Yes. It's not the one of course. close to us. Right. Yeah. They did that just because they knew it was going to be on the show. And so they just they just made up the fixes. I have never, ever done one of these. So it is rare. And I don't know that I'll ever get a chance to do one like this. The thing the pilot said about the FedEx thing, I don't think that's true. He might have met some of the smaller carriers, but even then they don't do that. They still go to a sort. Or drop off yeah, boxes. Yeah, they're on the ground long enough to yeah, go in and get coffee. And if, if there are any land. FedEx I'm feeders sure or... I'm dispatch isn't doing it anyway. No. If there's anybody that has used through clearances on a regular basis in that type of environment, middle of the night, quick stop, throw a box off, and get back in the air, let us know. But I can't imagine that's a normal action. Can you? No. Okay. Uh, you want to answer his last question here before moving to the feedback? What was it? Uh, he did ask a couple of run, uh, questions at the end, which I think would be fun to answer. Can I, can I use an approach to a closed runway if I'm not actually landing there, but I'm just planning to reach VMC? I think that's legal as long as you let everybody know, Hey, yeah. I plan on breaking this out as soon as I, breaking this off and canceling. I'm trying to go to a hospital. I think that's fine. I would caution anybody trying to do that, that they'd be very clear and and use plain english and let them know exactly what you're trying to do uh you know your destination should be the airport that's closed or the closed runway and make it known hey this is what i'm trying to do and if that changes because you can't break out you need to have an alternate plan so right the second question was if the mva the minimum vectoring altitude for us that's an altitude we see not the pilots is lower than the minimum descent altitude for the initial segment of an approach do I really need to climb back up to the MDA or can I just stay lower? Uh, go ahead. I'll let you hit that one. You can stay lower. You can absolutely stay lower. This is, uh, I, I've got, I've gotten into this debate at work numerous times. Mm. And what happens is controllers look at, for instance, on an RNAV, they look at the TAA altitude. Okay. Okay. And let's say the TAA is 4,000 feet, but the MVA is 3,000. But the once you're at that initial approach fix on that intermediate segment, the altitude is three thousand. I agree with that. There's it's clearly in the book. Provide an altitude to maintain until established on a segment of the approach that meets the MVA and other altitudes for IFR operations. It meets the MVA. You're just not using the TAA as a segment of the approach. It's sort of like cutting under the glide, you know, you're underneath the glide slope and intercepting from below. Yes. There's no reason a plane can't be out there in the TAA at 3000. They do it all the time. 
And once they hit that first point, they're at a legal altitude. Okay. There's no reason that can't happen. So with the caveat being they're already at that fix, let's say that the fix altitude was 1,800 and the MVA is 2,500. Can you do it then? No. Okay. You have to comply with the MVA, but you don't have to go out and get to the T-fix MVA or the higher MDA at the T-fix as long as you're complying with the minimum vectoring altitude the entire time. Yes. There's another case of this in our in our airspace um an approach into triad is 200 feet above the mva well oh. it's not even it's more than that it's 700 feet i know which one you're talking about above the mva and we commonly use three and the altitude on the approach says 3200 so if you're on the approach you're supposed to be at 3200 but if you're just some guy flying literally straight through the same spot in space you can be at three all day long i agree with that so that's silly you do and and pilots come back all the time uh don't we need to be at 3200 no you do not well more until you get to a point on the approach that allows you to go lower than that there's an approach into north racetrack i can't we always change the name of that airport where the one of the intermediate fixes is below the MVA up there. We would still have yes. to comply with the MVA. We would have yes. to get them higher to clear them. Yeah, some of those up there are tricky. Yes, okay. All right, thank you for sending that audio in. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. If there's any questions about a through flight or what we were actually accomplishing when uh, the controller did that, ask us, we'll follow up. Anything to add? No, that was a good good story. Yes, thank you. Oh, I want Feedback time. Feedback. All right, you want one or two? These are, I think these are pretty benign. All right, I'll start. Okay. Number one, from patron Charlie Kilo, gentleman and lady. Oh, right. Gentlemen, that's plural. Sorry, my my uh, earpiece fell out. <laughs> I want to include RH2 since she adds a nice professional opening and closing to the show. You had been discussing the availability of special information and notams for special events such as Oshkosh or sporting events attached are screenshots from flightplan.com. It shows a notice of a NASCAR event and clicking on it goes to the actual notice information. In this case, it is not a notum. I don't know about ForeFlight, but the free program, flightplan.com, does a good job with this sort of thing. Thanks, Charlie Kilo. <clears throat> I didn't put the screenshot in there, but it showed, uh, once they clicked on it, it showed the domestic notice page from the FAA with all yep. the information about a SID or arrival to that NASCAR airport. Thank you for sending that. Um, we that's what we use um Mm -hmm. when we're not at base ops (laughs) when we're somewhere that isn't base ops we use flightplan.com and uh it's nice when you have a bunch of like if you used it as a flight school and everybody had the same login you can go you could go in and see what everyone else is doing where they're going um or you could just take old flight plans that somebody else has already done Mm. and just paste it into a new, you know, flight plan. So anyway, we, we like that program. Cool. Thank you for sending that in. If anybody hasn't seen that flightplan.com, it's anybody can get on there. You don't need a login ID. You can even go on as a guest if you're trying to get general information about a flight plan too. So it pulls up maps. It's, it's a pretty user friendly page. Number two from Patreon, Charlie Alpha, AG and RH. There was a recent clip of live ETC audio posted on YouTube. Regarding a pilot entering class Delta airspace without establishing communication with the tower, the pilot claimed he was handed off, so presumably he was on flight following but never got a response from tower after five attempts because the controller was busy. Obviously, just because the controller is busy doesn't mean you can just go ahead and enter the airspace, much less actually join the pattern. He was already on a downwind when the tower first contacted him when the audio started, so it's clear the pilot deviated here and didn't follow regulations. 
then got snippy with the controller when this was pointed out. That's not the question. The question I have is regarded what's needed to enter the delta. All right, let me back up first. There's no handoff occurring. Handoff is a radar function where we're actually handing radar functionality, uh, radar identification to another controller, inter or intra facility using automation. That does not happen with our Delta airports, either one. Those, one of them has a scope. They can see who's coming. That's an important detail in triad. They have uh, the cigarette airport in the scratch pad. So they are forced, they're forced looking on all the approaches going into their airport. So they know who they are when they call. The other Delta down by Stanley Steamer, they do not have a scope. We do have to call in with an inbound unless we terminate a VFR and they have them call on their own. So we don't hand anybody off. We don't flash anybody on the scope. It's automated through either the SO or the LOA between the two facilities or a phone call. I just wanted to clarify that. All right. The answer seems clear. 91-129-C1. Each person must establish two-way radio communication with the ATC facility providing air traffic services prior to entering the airspace and therefore maintain those communications while within that airspace. But is that always just the tower? Could it be the surrounding Tracon or Center? Or if a pilot is on a flight following and talking to Center or Tracon, then coming into their destination, Delta, would Center or Tracon coordinate handing you off to a tower and eliminating the need for you to explicitly talk to the tower and hear your call sign back over the radio before entering the airspace? Or is it really as cut and dry as tower owns the Delta, you have to talk to them, no ifs, ands, or buts? This seems like a situation that you might run into with Triad Charlie over at, overlapping with the Cigarette Delta. Thanks again for the podcast, Page and Charlie Alpha. All right, we mentioned this, I think, a long time ago. And I don't know that we ever came out on one, one side of the argument 100%. In our airspace, it's implied. VFR, well, the IFRs we're not talking about. Those are getting handed off. Our letter of agreement says they're coming. There's no contact in Delta at any time of your IFR. You don't, just like Bravo and Charlie, you're going. You're cleared through all that airspace when you got your clearance. For, so we're really just talking about VFR airplanes. If, if, if cigarette is in your scratch pad, we fling you to them typically before you enter the Delta. We don't wait until you're in the Delta to say goodbye. What happens to you after that? I don't want to say I know a hundred percent. Have they ever told anybody to stay out? I've never seen that happen. No, they just go. Yeah. And typically, yeah, like you said, we don't, you know, the only ones that I might, uh, that I might not get, uh, transferred over to the tower in time is a VFR guy that I did a practice approach for and he's on final and he might, you know, get inside of the Delta, but, no one has ever said anything about that. The tower, that guy just sort of gets then treated like an IFR, I guess, even though he's not. Right. Um, yeah. Now, I think, though, our our situation with cigarette is a unique situation. Okay. They're, they have automatic releases. I don't know that a lot of Deltas have that. I think we're the only contract facility in the NAS that has that. And they have... We we sort of have automatic inbounds. I mean, we could just Correct. run planes in there all day long. Yes. Like three in trail, and the, t- <laughs> the tower would have nothing to say about it. Correct. You know, they, so I think that that relationship might be a little bit different. I think we've definitely talked about an overflight. So if you're just passing through and the question of, hey, do I need to call the tower? as I'm going through this airspace. And I think we sort of determined that, no, I'm talking to you. I'll work it out with the tower if I need to. Okay. And I do you don't need that. to call them. But in, I think in the case where you're arriving and you're going to land there or work the pattern or something, I, you know, an approach lets you go. I, I think you do. <clears throat> I don't disagree I with certainly you. wouldn't enter the pattern. I agree with that. Without having established <laughs> some kind of communication it's not on the tracon or the center controller to imply that you're cleared to do something in that airspace so they should be allowing you sufficient time to contact that tower worst case scenario there's not enough time i would not keep trucking one if it's so busy that he can't respond to you or he or she cannot respond to you you're entering a, a beehive 
Get right. out. Right. Get out. Exactly. Yeah. It's not like you have some implied uh, right to enter that airspace just because you were talking to the center of Tracon, especially if it's super busy. So if you can't get a hold of them and they don't have automation, a lot of Delta Towers don't have any way of knowing who you are. They don't, maybe VFRs, they just fling them and it's on the pilot to say who you are, what type of airplane, and for them to sequence you in. So that takes time. And if they are super busy, that would be prudent of you to wait outside of the airspace to establish the communication. So... I think the safest answer is establishing communications with the tower is the way to comply with that rule. Right. Because I, as the approach control, I don't own the airspace that you're going to be in. Right. Now, we own some of the delta that you wouldn't think that, you know, you think, okay, the tower owns all of that. And, and to a certain extent, they do. If you're VFR, you don't really care about what the Tracon owns. But I can fly planes on the arrival side of the airport through the Delta without talking to the tower. Yes. So things are not always what they seem. But when in doubt. Yes. Call it, Just make sure you're talking to someone before you start. Yeah. And going the back to the, center. going back to the Tracon might be even worse because they're probably busy too. They got rid of you for a reason. They're going to want you to work that out with the tower. It might be too big picture and too many assumptions being made, but I think that's the safest way to make sure you stay legal and not yeah. get in. Don't get into a back and forth about who's right and wrong on frequency. Just ask them. This is the way to get done with that argument. Tell me what you need me to do. We can talk about it later on the phone. The end. Right. Just skip <laughs> the fight. It's not worth having. Right. Moving on to number three. Number three. Is it my turn? Yes. Okay, from Victor Victor, MD. They signed off as an MD, so yeah. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yes. Uh, this is sort of a medical, right? I think uh, so. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, sort of. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed, anyway, <laughs> uh, I enjoyed listening to episode 197 <laughs> and especially the comments about penguins on the iceberg. One of your <laughs> listeners was a woman who was pregnant and had just completed her instrument rating. She asked how she could maintain currency while she was pregnant and was having trouble fitting in the cockpit. You failed to mention one of the best ways to maintain currency, especially during cold winter months with uh, low ceilings and icing in the clouds. And that strategy is to use an AATD simulator such as the Redbird FMX. I recommend it highly and would recommend it to a pregnant woman, a new mother, or anyone wanting to maintain instrument currency who could not fly in an airplane. Love your show. Heard you at Oshkosh. Great fun. Keep up the good work. Victor or Victor? Yes, I meant to take that out. Yes. Okay, thank you. Victor, Victor, CFI, CFII. MD. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there, the doctor's orders. <laughs> Get in a simulator. I don't remember it being an instrument rating, but... I, I would agree either way. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be an AATD. I think that I can't know. I don't remember what's one of those A's, but approved training device. I don't, somebody in the chat room can tell me what that stands for. Uh, but even desktop versions of Microsoft flight simulators stay on a checklist and seeing instruments can go a long way in keeping your brain in the game. So yeah. we, we did fail to mention that. Thank you for reminding us. All right. Two more. These are good ones. Okay. All right. Number four. From Patron Juliet Golf. Patron Juliet Golf here. I have a tip on lost comms that I didn't think was mentioned en route to the Taco Truck Airport shortly after being handed off by the mythical triad to Duke. I lost comms. I checked in with Duke. Things were fine. A little later, I wanted to begin my descent. It also occurred to me that the channel was unusually quiet. Hmm. hmm. I requested lower. No response. Checked various things on the panel and tried again. And again. I tried to use my handheld. I couldn't find the headphone dongle, duh, and <laughs> couldn't hear over the cabin noise. Isn't that a shame? Proceeded to Taco Truck Airport and landed VFR, called Duke Approach on the landline. They were very aware of the thing that was going on. I couldn't receive, but apparently I sure could transmit, but didn't know it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Never done that before. <laughs> All of which brings me to the point. Duke said, next time something similar happens in bold capital letters announce your intentions you might be transmitting <laughs> full disclosure i went back out to the plane powered up i pressed the push to talk switch 
saw the little red transmit light glow, still couldn't hear anything on the frequency. I sent the plane to the electronic shop the next day, but I won't forget the advice. But I hope that there is a not a next time. Thanks for your broadcast, Juliet Golf. Okay. Nice. So when you're frustrated and you can't find the right button and you're sure it's somebody else's fault, think about that, but don't say it <laughs> because it's possible, if not very likely, that you are transmitting and that everyone hears. How many times a day do we hear stuck mics? Oh, yeah. I mean, and we hear the whole conversation. <laughs> yes. And it usually involves something like, can you hear me? Something's weird. I can't. Can you hear me? And you, you, you could just... <laughs> sense their awkwardness of something doesn't sound right but guess what the entire world hears you and you are broadcasting so that's right best to have those arguments inside your brain by yourself don't broadcast them until you are positive that you are not transmitting (laughs) (laughs) oh i've never done that and said every swear word in the book (laughs) to my instructor who i thought was messing with me i think i've told that story but Everybody on ground control at my training airport in Florida heard me, and I was reminded of that when we got back from that flight by just about everybody inside of ops. So, mm. Mm, very embarrassing. Hot Mike. Hot Mike. Hot Mike. Hot Mike. So, announce yeah, yourself. I named Hot Mike Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's uh, got a good story of that. So, you know what? Everybody has a good story of a Hot Mike. This one lasted for like two minutes. Oh, oh nothing good can happen. In crushing down the Air Force <laughs> <laughs> at their own at their own airport oh, on no. the tower frequency. <laughs> oh man, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, it was so good, man. Mm. All right, you want the last one? Sure. Number five from our sound guy, Alpha Hotel. Let me just say thank you again, Alpha Hotel. Yes, thank you. Hey, guys, I hope all is well. The show just keeps getting better. So let's say you have a really busy day. VFR targets for miles, trying to get to Triad. A Cessna pilot checks in, Triad approach. Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4. Can I possibly get bumped to the front of the line? I don't think I can hold it anymore. (laughs) What do you do? (laughs) Cheers from the Smiling Box Bravo Alpha Hotel. (sighs) Hmm. You know, this is going to depend a lot on where this plane is and if he has to pass any other airports (laughs) on the way to ours. Uh, I would be less inclined to just, you know, bump you up to number one if you're going to fly past an airport that people go to all the time. Yeah. Yep. I agree with that. Um, But I'm sure... I say that now, but I'm always a sucker for, you know, somebody in (laughs) some sort of distress. It's hard for me to work out the scenario where you couldn't just keep trucking and we'll fit you in when you get here at our tiny little not busy airport. But yeah, it would be rare that you would you would just if you just kept going that you would be a conflict with someone. Right. I don't know. We have other runways too. We can usually shin you off on another runway, and we have the most runways. We do all the runways, <laughs> <laughs> and at an airport that say was using one runway for departures and one for arrivals, they might be able to <laughs> squeeze you in and say, "Look, I'm having a, I'm, we have a developing situation here. I need to get on the ground." Maybe don't give a ton of details. You're not declaring an emergency. You might get enough sympathy from the controller to make something happen. All right, all right. fine. We'll get you on the ground as soon as we can. I'm not suggesting you lie, but. Withholding all the details about your less than adequate planning with bathroom breaks uh, might be a better plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do like your idea. You Look, you're crossing over an airport right now. You're basically in the pattern. Enter it, land, do your thing, come back. Right. So hopefully you that doesn't happen. Yeah. I think a lot of pilots are prepared somewhere, shape or form to prevent that from becoming a in-flight emergency. <laughs> Piddle pack. <laughs> yes. What an amazing device. <clears throat> you know, I really thought that we were going to hear something from our sound guy about the auto tune, the alleged auto tune. Oh, 
Oh, wait. I'm glad you brought that up. He did not specifically say anything yet. At least he hasn't. I haven't seen it in the inbox. We did get several that have the, they know exactly what's happening. They do. Yes. They know exactly what's happening. And I will read at least one of them in a show coming up. The problem has been solved. It's not auto tune. It's really not a problem we're going to solve. It's the, my voice will still sound like this based on the procedure we're using, but it is something with our limiting. And there's some, oh. there's some technical definitions in the background that I don't know, but it, it's happening for a reason, but thank you for mentioning that. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Check out atcsax.com to find a great way to keep your ATC or pilot headset free from dust and dirt. They've picked up a lot on Instagram lately. Check out their cool little clips. We have feedback up to prior to October 18th, right on the show or respond to via email. If we missed yours, let us know. AG, anything to add before we hit the chat room for a minute? I do not. All right. Closing out episode 204 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk, Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Drop. Visit opposingbases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at opposingbases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.